Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ronald Joseph. I'm coming to you live from Queens, New York in my living room. Um, this is my first video that I'm doing for my YouTube channel and I'm going to discuss the highly debated topic of the Nike Vaporfly 4% and the Nike Vaporfly Next Percent. And we're gonna get into this. First, we're gonna go and talk about the history of the original Nike Vaporfly 4%. And we're gonna talk about where that name 4% came from because everybody just assumes that you put the shoes on and you'll be 4% better or you'll have a 4% better running economy. And that's not true. And I'm gonna tell you why because it's pretty simple. Now, Eliud Kipchoge, he ran the Berlin Marathon, I wanna say like three, four years ago, and he had on a shoe, it was a prototype. It was a prototype of the Nike Streak 6. And if you see him running the race and you see the pictures, he has the insoles of the shoe flopping out the back and it cost him some time for the marathon. He was gonna have like a big world record. But anyway, Nike ended up putting out that shoe, the Nike Streak 6. Now, this is not the exact version of the Nike Streak 6. This is the Flyknit version. If you wanted to spend a little more money, you got a Flyknit version. The upper is really nice and stretchy. As you can see, this is the Rio colorway from the Olympics. Now, let me go in the box. One second, guys. And here we have the original Nike Vaporfly. These are my own shoes. They're two years old. They've never been worn and they're brand new. Now, <clears throat> that's where the Vaporfly got its name from, from this shoe. Vaporfly is 4% more efficient than this shoe. Now, let's go back to this 4% number. Now, let's say that I was running marathons in this shoe, and then I switched to this. I might be 4% more efficient in this versus this. Maybe, might be 3%, might be two and a half. Depending on the day, who knows? All right, now, since we got the history of where the shoe got the name is coming from, let's put this back in the box. <clears throat> now, we're gonna talk about this fantastic shoe right here that was once my favorite shoe to run in and now is no longer. We'll discuss that a little later. As you can see, this shoe has a nice and squishy foam here. It's awesome, it has like these little rubber pads here on the bottom rubber on your forefoot. Now, this shoe doesn't have very much traction. This shoe is very unstable. When you're taking a turn, your whole ankle will like wobble and the shoe is very soft and becomes a cushion. So when you're taking like a hairpin turn, you gotta slow down a lot because your whole ankle can do like this little dance thing and you might twist your ankle and you'll be in trouble. So that is a big con of this shoe. Not stable at all when you gotta make a lot of turns on a course. All right. Now, most shoe companies, they use two types of foam for their shoes. One is called TPU and the other is called EVA. Now, the companies just don't call it TPU foam or EVA. They'll rebrand it with their own name. Um, like Skechers, they use Revlite. Um, Nike uses Zoom Air. Um, so they rebrand it, but it's pretty much the same stuff. However, this shoe uses a foam called p -Bax. Now, p excuse me, guys, have, p is this, like, material, well, I shouldn't say material, but it's kind of like these little pellets that you, when you squeeze them, they compress, and when you get off them, they contract and expand. So, this is made up of a bunch of p pellets all fused together to make foam. Now, this shoe, as many know, it does have a carbon fiber, full-length carbon fiber plate running through the shoe carbon fiber plate, it's just like this. It's not skinny, it's not wide, and then really skinny and wide, it runs the whole length of the shoe. All right, so it gives you a real good feeling of propulsion every step that you take, especially if you run on the black part, on your forefoot. It really is just gonna make you feel like you're running on, it feels like a Hoka. Um, I've had Hoka Clifton 2s, it feels like a Hoka, but it's way lighter than the Hoka, and it gives you propulsion. It, the shoe is just phenomenal. Now, before we go further on into this shoe about the carbon fiber debate and everything, um, a lot of people get injured or have been injured wearing this particular shoe because they just automatically hear, oh, 4% faster, let me get it, boom. 
put it on and the shoe is not made for them. And I've seen people wreck their feet, man, break bones in their feet. The shoe is not made for everybody. People don't go get fitted to see if the shoe is made for them. And people are complaining, oh, this shoe is terrible. I got hurt wearing this shoe. I'm like, the shoe didn't pick you. You picked the shoe. Don't blame the shoe. Blame yourself. All right. Now, I'm going to go put this shoe away now. Because everybody seems to think this carbon fiber plate is magical. And I'm going to touch on to that without doing an actual scientific study. I'm going to say why I don't think that's the case. All right. So now, guys, I'm going to grab you another pair of shoes. <clears throat> now, this is the Nike Zoomfly Flying. It. Now, the second pair of Nike Vaporfly 4%. It literally looked just like this. The exact same shoe, the same fly knit, stretchy upper, the same bottom. The second pair of Zoom Fly or the second pair of Vapor Flies, it had the same carbon fiber plate. It had the Zoom X P Bax foam. Now, this shoe has the same carbon fiber plate. The only difference between this shoe and the fly knit Vapor Flies is this has like a little taller stack height, like two millimeters, and the foam is different. This doesn't use ZoomX foam. It uses Nike's React foam, and this shoe does have a carbon fiber plate. So I said to myself, hmm, this shoe must be pretty darn good if it has the plate in it. The only difference between both shoes, the Flyknit version, which I did have, the orange pair, and this is the foam. So this shoe should be feel pretty close to the Vaporfly Flyknit. Guys, that is not the case. <laughs> This shoe feels absolutely nothing <laughs> like the Vaporfly uh, Fly Knits. I was very disappointed in that shoe. Um, I paced Boston last year, a friend of mine in that shoe. We ran 256.23 together, so I have experience running in that shoe for a long time. Very, very comfortable. Um, that foam in that shoe, that React foam, is nothing like that Zoom X foam in the Vaporfly. Absolutely not. The two shoes are nothing alike. So now I came to the conclusion that the carbon fiber plate is not what makes the shoes magical. It's actually the ZoomX foam. So I said, you know what? Let me take this a step further. Now, this shoe that I just chucked, it has the carbon fiber plate, but it doesn't have the foam. So I said, let me go the other way. Let me get a shoe with the foam, but doesn't have the carbon fiber plate. Now, that shoe would be the Nike Pegasus Turbos. I'm not a big Pegasus guy. I never liked the original Pegasus. One for me, I had a pair of the Rio colorway, that pink and lime green, that color, 30 bucks. I wore them once, put them back in the box, didn't like them. Now, this is the women's Nike Pegasus Turbo XX. Not many people have these. I haven't seen many women in them. This is a $200 shoe. Um, luckily it's a woman's 12. I got them for 50 bucks. So I said, let me buy a pair and let me see. Now this shoe, I don't know if you can see it on the bottom. It says ZoomX foam. It does use ZoomX foam. Same foam as the 4%, just doesn't have the carbon fiber plate. So I put these on one day, went outside, ran like 12 miles. I was running like a 720 pace, 730 pace. And I could tell this shoe feels a lot closer to the Vaporfly than the Zoom Fly Flyknits. But I didn't know how fast this shoe was, because I didn't run fast in it. When I ran Boston in the uh, Zoom Fly Flyknits, I was running like, I don't know, we were running like a 640 pace, something like that. So we were moving. This, I was outside, I was doing like 720, just for a few handful of miles, so I really couldn't tell. So yesterday, I wore this shoe on a treadmill, two and a half mile warm up. Um, like a 7.30 pace overall. I stopped the treadmill, I went to the bathroom, I came back out. I said, I'm gonna test these shoes and see how they feel when you put some real speed to them. So I did a five and a quarter mile run. Um, I set the treadmill at 9.0, that's what that, 6.39, uh, 6.40 pace. And I did five and a quarter miles, felt good. And then I did a 2K push. Um, a friend of mine, Boyd Carrington, he coaches people, have them do 2K Tuesdays. I said, I'm going to do one 2K to finish my run in this shoe. So I cranked the treadmill up. from. It was, I started at five and a quarter miles, and I finished at 6.5 uh, miles. So I cranked the treadmill up to 
I'm moving, I'm moving. Crank it 11.5, 11.8. Um, like the last half a mile, I cranked it to like 12.3 and I'm cooking. And this shoe just felt absolutely fantastic. And this shoe is not light because it has like this little sock liner in it now. Because it's meant to be like a cross training shoe as well. So this adds a little weight to it, but this shoe just felt a lot better <laughs> than this shoe. Felt way, like it had way more speed in it. So I finished the 2K in six minutes and 19 seconds. That was a 506 pace to end my workout. So I'm under the impression that the carbon fiber plate is not what makes the shoe. It's the foam. It's who makes foam is what makes the shoe. Now we have other companies now. Um, Hoka has already, Hoka has two carbon fiber shoes already. Um, they're not as good as uh, <laughs> the Vapor Flies. Uh, the Hoka's are a lot heavier. That's for one. And the plate in the Hoka starts out wide and the back of the shoe starts out wide back here. And then up here, it gets skinny and it forms into a fork, like a two-pronged fork. So it's not the whole length of the shoe. It's not a carbon fiber full length plate like the Nike. And the shoe's heavy. Um, definitely not good as the Nikes, I would assume. Um, who else is making? Brooks? I believe Brooks is coming out with a shoe, carbon fiber. Now everybody's making these carbon fiber shoes, um, but they don't have the foam. You need the Zoomax foam. The PBAX foam is like, it's like a game changer, guys. All right. Now that we finished talking about that, what we're going to do now is we're going to get back to this 4% topic that everybody's going crazy over. Now we're going to break this back out. All right. Remember these? First shoe I had. And now we're going to go back to these. Now, like I said before, this shoe is supposed to be 4% less efficient than this shoe. All right. We get that. Like I said, if I'm running marathons and knees... These are going to make me maybe 4% better, efficient, maybe 3%, 2%, who knows. Now, let's drop this. And let's pick up <clears throat> this uh, cement block. This is the Nike um, Lunar Lawn Flying Epic. What is this? Nike Lunar Epic <laughs> Flying It Shields. Now, these shoes are like water repellent. Um, you run in the rain, like light rain, and like the water bounces off. So these are great. Love these shoes. But this is like a 10-ounce shoe. This shoe's heavy. So now, let's drop this. So if this shoe is 4% less efficient than the vapor fly that I just dropped, what is this shoe? Let's say you're running marathons and knees. What is this shoe? 8%, 9% less efficient, 10%? Let's drop that. Let's drop this. Now, let's say you are running like a 3.30 marathon for argument's sake, which isn't terrible at all. And you're running in, let's say, a really heavy shoe like a a6 gel kayano that thing's like 12 ounces and like my size 11 13 ounces it is heavy now you go from the a6 gel kayano to this you just know you just no longer improve by four percent because that gel kayano is like 12 maybe 13 percent like did a whole study on this they compared a bunch of shoes and they saw how less efficient they were to this shoe like I said, Nike did the study, so a lot of people assume that they just did it to like hype up their own shoe. I, for one, believe that the study is real. Um, and I want to say the A5 Gel Kayano, somebody can go look up the study for me. Um, they were like 12 or 13% less efficient than these. The Gel Kayano is like all the way on the bottom. It was like the least efficient shoe. So if you're coming from a 330 marathon in Gel Kayano, then you switch to this. Forget about it. That 3.30 marathon might turn to 3.15 or 3.17 or whatever the case may be. So you're going to think these shoes are like magic. Pretty much it. Now, I'm going to drop this shoe and we're going to go into another shoe. We're going to catch up with the times now, people. Almost. Now, this shoe is the Nike. Vaporfly next percent. As you can see, look at the thickness of the foam on both shoes. Let me spin it this way. Big difference here, guys. Big difference. This shoe has way more foam. This shoe has way more cushion. And this shoe has more foam in the forefoot versus this shoe. Now, if you are a forefoot runner and you pride yourself on running on this black area here, this shoe is going to feel like magic. Um, I would held steadfast against buying this shoe because this shoe was so good to me. It was like the holy grail. 
I said, if it's not broke, I'm not going to try and fix it. So I went and got two more pairs of this shoe. I had the original pair, the ice blue color, and then I went and got this, which I haven't even worn yet. And I had a teammate of mine. He gave me the orange pair of the original Vaporflies. And I ran a marathon in the original Vaporflies, um, downhill, Big Bear, uh, 228.31 with a bad hamstring. So that was pretty good. And I swore, like, best shoe ever. Now, this is the BRS limited relief version of this shoe. BRS stands for Blue Ribbon Sports. Um, for Nike with Nike, they were Blue Ribbon Sports based out of, as you can see there, Santa Monica. So that's where it gets this fancy coloring and writing from. Limited produce shoe. I said, you know what? Let me get this. I'm going to wear these for Boston because not many people are going to have these. Now, I did a little comparison between this shoe and this shoe. Um, my, my orange pair, the crimson pair. So I took the crimson pair, ran a mile on the treadmill. They felt phenomenal, as usual. And then I put this shoe on. When I ran for about the first 30 seconds in this shoe, I was like, ugh, that crimson shoe, that original Vaporfly is no longer the holy grail. <laughs> this is it. So I did four miles in these. They felt pretty solid. They felt fantastic. And I took them off. And then I went back to the original Vaporfly, the crimson pair, put them right back on. And when I put them on, guys, they felt like they had 500 miles on them. I was just like defeated. I was like, oh my God, this shoe feels terrible now. Because <laughs> I got my foot not used to this. So this is the holy grail. The only real con about this shoe that I'm not crazy about is the upper, the way the upper fits. Now, Nike calls this a vapor weave upper. I don't know if anybody's ever had the Nike Mayfly Light SE. I've had, I have like seven pairs. It uses like a similar like ripstop upper is what they call on the Mayfly Light SEs. This just feels like a reinforced version of that and it's see-through. Um, right here in the bottom of the shoe, right here, my foot, it, it, it just starts to wrinkle up. The feel doesn't feel like it's, it's kind of, I, I got room here. Kind of like I guess a woman when they put on heels and like the tip of the heel is pointy and your feet can't get in there. It feels funny. But anyway, it has more foam in the forefoot and this shoe is the lightest vapor fly known to date, which is greater because lighter equals faster. Um, so I ran a 50K race in these. My first time ever running in them in a race. Um, I went through the marathon portion, 239.40. That is a PR for the flat course on a marathon. And I finished the 50K, 313.19, like a 612 pace, which was, I had the day of all days. I didn't have to stop, nothing. Um, the next day I woke up in the morning, my legs, they were not sore. I just had blisters on my feet because of my socks. I didn't like lubricate my feet, my own fault. But I felt like I didn't run a 50K, so now this is the new holy grail for me. Um, Nike now has moved on from this shoe and they have what we have now, the Alpha Fly. However, the Alpha Fly has even more <laughs> cushion than this. I don't know how that's possible because this thing feels literally like a freaking Hoka Clifton. Um, but anyway, the Alpha Fly is, is a little bit heavier. I've yet to try that shoe out, so I can't tell you how it feels. Um, pretty much it. They were giving away the shoes at the Olympic trials and some of the people at the Olympic trials were taking the shoes and putting them on eBay to sell them because Nike put the shoes out um, that same day with a limited release just like this and they sold out in like maybe like a minute, two minutes, they were gone, done. So resellers were buying the shoe and they were putting them on eBay now. If you go on eBay, you can see a pair of Alpha Flies ranging anywhere from on the cheap side, $500 to all the way to like $1,500. People are buying them because they can't wait for the actual general public release which is we don't know it might be a month it might be two months um i'm assuming nike's gonna be smart and do it before boston but who knows but that's pretty much all i have to say about this whole vapor fly um debate on it cheating and it helping people i mean the shoes are illegal so if they're legal why not go buy them it gives you the biggest advantage that you could possibly possibly have out there I mean, if it's there, why not take it? Some people like to be um, running purist, um, quote unquote. I do have a friend of mine, I'm not gonna mention her name. She swore off that she would never get this freaking shoe. And I just kept telling her, you gotta get this shoe. You gotta, no, I'm not wearing that shoe. I'm wearing XYZ, I'm not mentioning the other brand. And she's a really, really, really good like runner. She's like close to me, she's really good. And 
she finally bit the bullet and I saw her run a race. She won the race and she had on a pink pair of these. And then I messaged her on uh, Instagram and I said, how'd the shoes feel? She was like, oh my God, they were great. They were like the best. I was like, I told you, I'm not gonna try to steer you down the wrong path. So um, they do work for a lot of people. But like I said, the con of the shoe, it is just very unstable when you're going around corners. So you got to like really, really be careful. And God forbid that it's raining and you're raping in a pair of vapor flies. You got to make turns. That's a very, that's almost like running on ice. Um, I wore these, the 4%, the original pair. I had the orange pair on the crimson. And I ran a four mile race. I ran 21 uh, 49 for the four miler and it was the rain it was on a boardwalk and it was a little rain on the boardwalk from the night before so we had to make a hairpin turn and we went to make the hairpin turn it's like ee, and then like <laughs> slow down to a crawl and make the turn so you don't fall or break your ankle when you're running so that's pretty much it guys thank you for watching uh my first official video on my youtube channel um i'm gonna go upload this now I'm excited to do this because I'm going to get really in depth about running topics, um, a lot of mental slash psychological stuff. People run marathons and they just tend to fall apart late in the race. I've had that happen to me uh, five times on my way to qualifying for Boston my first time. So I've been there before. Um, before I end this video, I would like to tell everybody who does not know me out there uh, 10 years ago. Uh, 2009 in July, I was 212 pounds. Uh, I had no running background, never. I mean, I would play football as a kid, you know, pick up basketball, but I didn't run in school, track or any of that. I didn't play on the basketball team, baseball, nothing like that. Um, and I decided one day, you know, August 1st, I was gonna start running. And you know, I started running maybe like two miles, like 11 minute pace, and then I would come home and ride my bike. I did that for a month, the whole month of August. I ran and I cycled every day. And in 10 weeks, I went from 212 to 174. Um, I continued to run. I was running a pair of Nike Air Max 95s. That's how clueless I was, just to give everybody a uh, depiction of how clueless I was. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a watch. I ran with my phone in my hand when I first started. Um, I ran for a year by myself. And then I ran a five local a local 5K, 2010, like early August. Um, and I ran in a pair of New Balance, I want to say. They felt kind of like, I don't know, felt like a nine-ounce shoe back then, I guess that was like. And I ran my first 5K ever. It was a really, really small local race. I ran 21.12 for my first 5K ever. I came in fourth place, guys. I thought that 21.12 relative to the place, fourth place, I thought 21.12 was like a 15-minute 5K. You couldn't tell me anything. I didn't know anything what was deemed as like really fast or anything like that. So I got a trophy. I felt good about myself. I went home and I started researching races, 5Ks and everything and all this that. And I started seeing winning time like 16, 20, 17 minutes. And I was like, whoa, slow down, Ron. Pump the brakes. You're not as good as you think you are. You got a lot of work to do. And from there, I just started researching um, shoes and stuff. And I ran my first marathon in 2012 right before hurricane sandy had hit us um i'm from an area where hurricane sandy destroyed the boardwalk it destroyed all our homes everything so i ran a marathon like two months before that i was probably like 170 pounds but i really wasn't experienced in the marathon like i said i didn't follow like a training plan or anything i would just go out there and run like 20 miles at like a 9 39 minute pace or whatever if i had no plan no watch still and my first marathon was rough uh, I got to like mile 13. I was wearing a pair of heavy, heavy Mizunos. I got to like mile 13. It was on the boardwalk in Rockaway. And my feet, just the bottom of my feet, they just started to kill me. Um, I ran off the boardwalk. My car was parked close by. I jumped in my car. I switched shoes, jumped back on the boardwalk. But the damage was done. My first marathon, guys, was like four hours and 47 minutes. And that was back in 2012. So I'm not some guy that, you know, just ran in high school and in college and it's really good. So I can pretty much, I can relate to everybody. Everybody who's just starting out and they're doing the Jeff Galloway, run half a mile, walk half a mile, um, doing a five hour mat. So I can relate to 
everybody from started all the way from the bottom, or should I say start all the way from the bottom and you progress, progress, and now you kind of like all the way, so I can relate to those people. So I would love for everybody to check out this channel. As of today, my fastest marathon is 228.31. Like I said before, that was going downhill. Um, a lot of people <laughs> wanted to discredit that, so I came back and I ran 239.40. Uh, um, I do not have a great diet. Um, I do drink my fair share of alcohol, just to let everybody, I do work two jobs. I'm not, um, I don't have any kids, um, so I guess I'm lucky with time, to have time to train, but um, it's nothing special. Really, if you put your mind to it, anybody can do it if you have the time and you put your mind to it. That's pretty much it, time and dedication. That's it, there's a lot of times in summer, Two years ago, I'm waking up at 3.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning in August, in July, to beat the heat. Everybody else, 3.30 a.m., they're sleeping, I'm outside, I'm trying to get better, I'm trying to improve. Um, so it's just time and dedication, that's all it is. Thank you guys for watching this video, and that is gonna be it. I'm so excited for this channel, guys. Thank you so much. Bye.